Hi, I'm Liz. And I'm Marie. And this is Mock It, a podcast sponsored by MetroStar, where we take a deep dive into UX design, trending topics, and talking with our friends in the field. Let's get started. Yeah, so today we are actually doing a special episode with the MetroStar interns. So uh, before uh, we really jump in, I'm going to hand it over to you two to introduce yourselves. And then uh, once you do a quick intro, I will follow up with some more like fun get to know you questions. Oh, okay. I'm first. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So uh, my name is Shane Mady. I am a senior at the College of New Jersey. My uh, degree is in computer science and my dream career. Um, I think my dream career would be working as a virtual reality uh, developer. Uh, I just am fascinated with the whole thing. Let's take it away, Ahmed. Cool. Um, how's it going, everyone? My name's Ahmed. I study uh, data science and philosophy at Indiana University of Bloomington. Um, I don't know if we're going to do the dream career thing now, but I'm really interested in like the, the data side uh, of things, trying to find like hidden insights in large data sets. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, you, yeah. Those are both really <laughs> awesome dream careers. <laughs> yeah, I was like, oh, that's going to be our, our, like, the fun question gets to you because, yeah, you, you all just jumped right in. So, uh, yeah, well, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us on Market. We're excited to have you. Uh, as, as we dive in, can you all let us know a little bit about your experience at MetroStar and then give us a little bit of a rundown of the intern project that you worked on this past summer? Yeah. So the intern project was trying to find um, data from census to make it more usable for cities. The city we were working with was Bloomington, Indiana, which was awesome for me because I study here and I was working here over the summer. So it was cool to try to see the insights actually like in the community. If I were to look at a map of the data, I could say, oh, I know exactly where that downtown area mm -hmm. is. Um, so we were trying to find hidden insights in the census data set to make it more readable. Um, and Shane can talk more about it as well, about how we tried to reduce kind of the complexity of if someone was trying to read something from census, they would need to understand a lot of the technical documentation. We tried to reduce that to have like an easy to use website. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Sorry, Shane. Oh. Can we jump into how did you reduce that? Right? It sounds super easy. And you're like, <laughs> we just reduced that data. But I know it's not that simple. Yeah. So there were uh, a couple of things we did. I think uh, first and foremost, uh, I guess accessing the information itself, we simplified significantly. Um, when you query on census data using their API, you have to gather these codes uh, and these codes all individually represent some different thing, like, say, um, I don't know, number of people in a certain age group. But in order to find this uh, variable code, you kind of have to go looking through uh, a lot of different places. And once you get that, you also have to query uh, the geography specifications. So what we've done is actually convert it into something where you could just uh, specify a subject. So if you're looking at age groups, you could just uh, type in age groups and you'll get all the information you want. Uh, another big thing, census, um, when you query it, you can only do it one year at a time. We've made it so you could query all the information at once. Uh, and also, I just want to specify this. We did this using the ACS five-year data. Um, yeah. What is that? And, why did why is that important to call out? Okay, so You're on fire this was with these like questions. I'm like, yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> when we were starting the project, uh, kind of in the first week, we had to figure out what data set we wanted to use to best answer these uh, problem statements that we we're giving. That we could talk more about those, but. Um, these five problem statements kind of described the problems uh, faced by some uh, Bloomington personas that we wanted to address. And in order to do that, we needed to find the data. Now, to find the data, we had to go on Census API and go through all these different surveys they had and pretty much try to figure out which one works best for us. And that's the one we ended up choosing. And just to also add on to that, um Specifically for the American Community Survey, which, which is the ACS, um, it has the most variables for exactly what we needed. And then the five-year one has a higher degree of accuracy compared to like the three-year one-year because it's taken over a longer period of time. Yeah. Cool. 
Did not know that. Yeah. No. And, and I was um, asked, um, I feel like you asked some, such good questions. I was like, oh, like, can I keep up? Um, your, so did you all talk to any users? You just had personas that you were using and then your da- like the data you used came from these responses? Correct. So we spoke with uh, people from uh, the city of Bloomington, as well as talking a little bit to some people uh, on the census side, just to kind of see what they thought about the project. And then um, if, if it's OK, what uh, problem statements were you all trying to answer and trying to help with um, help, help to address maybe? Yeah. So Bloomington is a college town, so they have a lot of transient student population. So for them to try to fully understand their communities can be kind of hard because they're always moving around. So we wanted to try to help them with that. Um, so one of it was trying one of them was trying to identify who is a student and who's not a student. Um, what are the age groups? What are the income groups associated with that, with whether they are, are or are not a student um, and th- information like that? Yeah. And on top of that, um, we wanted to see how that information actually affected Bloomington. So with the nature of having a transient uh, student popula- population, uh, a lot of them are working part time, which is uh, a very big focus of some of these problem statements. And we wanted to see how that part-time work affected the overall, uh, I guess, like median income of Bloomington. So like, since you have a lot of students working part-time with not a very large income, that kind of affects the statistics for all of Bloomington. And we want to try to separate the students from the permanent residents so that they could get a better read on uh, things like uh, income. Cool. Were you guys able to do that? Separated yeah. out. Nice. Well, you said that's what you wanted to do. Just, just checking. No, no, I love, I, I love it. Um, I'm sort of laughing to myself. I, um, I lived in Ann Arbor for a few years, and I, it, it reminds me kind of me what Bloomington is like with being like the college town, mm-hmm. and like what yeah. you're saying with like the, the transientness of it. Because in the summer, like it was like super chill and super quiet, but then like when students are back in town, I mean, it's like. You know, the city floods with the kids or, well, adult students too. (laughs) Now I'm just aging myself. (laughs) uh, Yeah, that's that's funny. Um, And then um, what do you think the the research that you did and the data that you found, what type of impacts do you think it had on um, Bloomington and, and then maybe like cities like Bloomington for future use? So I think we can take a lot from it. So part of what we did was on the reporting side, just trying to showcase what information we already have about the demographics of a location. But on the other side, on the data science side, which I was the data scientist intern, um, trying to then use that information to predict out into the future what's going to be happening. So we were able to predict up to five years in the future. So to put that into context, for the ACS five year, for some years, it could take up to seven years before you were to finally get information for the year you wanted. It takes five years to do the survey and then some time to synthesize it and then for them to publish it. So what my model did was it took previous years and predicted to the future five years. So that could be kind of a 12 year gap on on the high end. Um, So with that, cities can then understand, okay, if my population is gonna be going here, what are things that I could do to then better prepare for it? Um, And then with that, we can talk more about it as well. We found some like specific kinds of variables that had a significant impact on population changes that they could also focus in on. That's cool. What are those specific variables? So off the top of my head, I remember one of the major ones was for an income group under 10,000. If somebody was making a salary under $10,000, they would need to have the ability to walk to work, for example, Mm -hmm. as their means of transportation. So if you were to then map out where uh, people making that sort of income would live, you can then see where the downtown areas are or where they're likely to go work. Do they have the ability to walk there? Is it always through highway? Is it mostly grass? Do they have to walk on the side of the road? Stuff like that. I want to build on that. Um, Additionally, we could talk more about this later, but on top of the five problem statements, later on within the project, we took a look at uh, what you call loads data, which is kind of, we mapped out using census's data uh, where most workers live and then where their jobs are. And then we kind of use that to compare with each other to kind of see how the nature of... um, job flow is in the city so i i have a question that uh this is very interesting so i I have a look this may be a very specific question but did you 
did you all look at any economic data with that? With like, for instance, like people could only who make under 10K could only walk to work. Like, um, was there hmm. like what like rent prices, for instance? Like, I assume you probably depending upon how people how far people are willing to w- walk. You know, you only have like a mile, maybe mile and a half you know, like distance mm-hmm. for where they, they could work. Um, did you ever look into like, like housing prices or how housing affected that? Or is that like out of scope? And this is just like totally curiosity from, from what you all have been saying. So we didn't directly look at that. Um, and part of the difficulty is if let's say we wanted to identify a specific income group, um, census does something in a way such that we cannot ask for more than one thing's at one time and then get kind of the intersection of that. So if we wanted to say how many people of a certain age group and then income, we would get two separate answers that were not related. It was not people of that age group for an income. So try to trying to combine housing information with that would be too hard. Oh, that, that was, yeah. I didn't, I didn't know that about that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Bummer. Yeah. They do that. Say, <laughs> yeah. Uh, at uh, the beginning of the project, like the very beginning when we were handed pretty much like the assignment of what we wanted to do, uh, reading through all the problem statements, I was like, oh, this will be a piece of cake. We we could just like pair two variables together and get the information we want. Little did I know you can't specify. You can't be like, OK, we, I want someone who's enrolled in school and also has this income or something like that you, you can't really do that you have to find a specific variable that would describe both of those things yeah and part of why census does that is so that people could freely put up, uh, write down all their information as needed without having somebody else saying especially if you're in a more kind of farmland kind of area if there's only two people in a zip code you can pretty much tell all the information mm-hmm. about it so they try to um disguise it in a way such that you can still get actionable insight without necessarily knowing too specific information. I think they have something called the 72 rule with after 72 years, they're then able to release it. And I think just this year, they've released something from 72 years ago where you can find out full information about a person. Yeah. Wow. This is, this is cool. This is interesting. I had like a really morbid thought about <laughs> did they release it after 72 years? Because like, I don't know what the average, like, lifespan is but i feel like it's around there that's exactly what it was yeah See? <laughs> at the time that they enacted the, the rule that was the average life or yeah. i think 71 might have been the average lifespan so they did one year one extra year. yeah something like that I mean, yeah it's, not not morbid. It's, it's you know very, the dots. very realistic <laughs> yeah realistic it's like, that's not helpful for anyone besides my personal information is out there and i'm no longer here yeah <laughs> <laughs> My aunts or my uh, dependents can learn about it. <laughs> I think even Ancestry.com, something like that, they integrate it with it. So as you get information about you, you can find information about like the areas that your grandparents might have grown up. Yeah. Oh, that's, that's cool. Yeah. yeah. So um, with uh, so mm-hmm. with your internship and then also in regards to this project, uh, what's one thing that both of you are super amped up about? It could be the internship in general about you know working at Metro Star, or it could be something project specific. Mm. Mm. tough one <laughs> uh, i guess just um my whole experience at metro star it's been really nice working with everyone here uh i'm a big fan of everyone here everyone's really nice um i've just really enjoyed the experience and um i've also learned quite a lot um working through the project awesome for sure. Five minutes of trying to figure out a problem by yourself is worth a semester of somebody just telling you what to do. So actually being able to like scrape your knees and try something out, invaluable. Oh, great. Well, I mean, that's like, I feel like, um, you know, everyone wants a job, wants mm-hmm. to like dig in and learn. And then like, you feel very accomplished when you kind of get into it. And, you know, just like you're saying, you're not told, you get to discover. Mm-hmm. Right. Or very like, so. oh, sorry. Um, like you did your PMP, how it's like PMP Island or how it happens oh, yeah. in the real world or, <laughs> right. It's nice. Like, right. You have how it's supposed to go when you're in school or learning anything. And then you like get real world yeah. applicable experience and you're yeah. like, oh, okay, we'll adjust. <laughs> yeah. That's the thing. Cause like in school, you're handed a project and the professor is kind of, you know, depending on the lessons you've had prior to this project, you kind of know how your professor expects you to solve the things within this project, like uh, certain methods of coding, mm-hmm. I suppose. Uh, but 
when you're doing this in a real world environment, you have this problem and you, you're up to yourself to figure out how you want to go about this. And, you know, obviously you want to make sure that it's the best way to do it because you need to make sure it's scalable for the rest of the project. Yeah. Uh, so if you all had 10 more weeks here at Metro Star working on this project, what little nooks and crannies would you want to dive more into? That's a okay. good one. <laughs> yeah. Um, for me, I would want to do more on the predictive analytics mixed with actual physical location information, trying to put it on a geographic sense so people could say, okay, if something is going to grow, where exactly is it going to grow and why? And trying to, to bring kind of both of those sides together. I think for me, um, I would just like to, you know, try to finish up everything we were working on. You know, uh, we didn't necessarily get to all of the problem statements or like reach full completion with like the loads data. And if I had the extra time, I just want to kind of sort that all out and make sure it's all done. Cool. And I oh, know. So that... oh, go for it. Oh, sorry. I was just going to say, I would also like to explore some other things like uh, maybe building. We, we used uh, Fast API for our API, and it kind of created uh, its own page for the user to uh, query information. And I was kind of thinking, like, hmm, what if we like made our own uh, page similar to that? Because towards the end of the project, we realized that Fast API kind of slows down uh, with some larger data sets because it uh, tries to display information on the page. But if we could kind of make our own version of that, maybe we could speed it up. Nice. Cool. I was going to take it back a step. I know, Ahmed, you said you were a data scientist. And if you wanted to go through what that role is, um, that'd be great. And then Shane, I'm not sure. I don't recall your position. All right. So I was the data engineer on this project. Cool. Anything more about that? What does that mean? If you're not okay. going to school for that, or so, <laughs> me, myself, uh, and I also like so for a third grader. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. So, uh, in reference to this project, or I guess yeah. necessarily any project, um, data engineer it refers to a role where I pretty much try to ensure that uh, from point A to point B throughout the streamline of uh, our project and where it connects with each other, that the data flows in a way that um, makes sure everyone gets what they need and it's organized and like quality data. So first we pull the data from census and then say we want our uh, full stack developer who's working on the API to be able to use that data in the way that they want. I, I need to make sure that uh, from this point to this point, I do whatever needs to happen in order for the data to be usable on the end. Cool. How, how do you do that? <laughs> like, <laughs> like, assuming it's some kind of code. Design. Yeah, is it through code? Like, are you like synth synthesizing? Yeah, so that's a couple of things. So firstly, it's uh, I was working with uh, one of the other interns, uh, Daniel Vasquez, I believe his last name's pronounced. Sorry, Daniel, if that's wrong. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, we worked together to uh, pull in the data from census, and then we kind of restructured it. Uh, one of the major problems, are not necessarily a problem, but one of the things we needed to do was uh, one of our other interns, uh, Jawan, who is working with uh, Tableau, um, Tableau is a third-party visualization software, and in order to ingest the data, it needs to be structured in a specific manner. So that's able, it's actually able to like handle the information and make use of it. So uh, that was one thing we made sure it was restructured so that it fit better into that. And then also, uh, we just needed to concatenate like all the years together and uh, some other specific specifications. Once that's all restructured, um, I was working with the database. Uh, so I had to create the database, create the tables, uh, and decide how those tables are related to each other. And then once that's all made, uh, put it in the database. 
and then make sure that the other interns are actually able to access that data. That seems very intense. <laughs> Uh, I mean, once you get the hang of it, it's kind of (laughs) easy. Cool. And then, Ahmed, do you want to talk about what it means to be a data scientist? Yeah. So a data scientist is a very general term. So for the specific use case of this project, um, it was trying to find um, kind of hidden information so that you can predict the future. So for us, um, when I was trying to predict uh, population, for example, there are many different ways to do that. On a high level, you can kind of just look at previous population years and then use that to predict out into the future. But by doing that, you don't necessarily find the determining factors about why the population is growing. So what I did was I made a model that took in context of other college towns and um, look, look through all the variables that census had for the ACS5. So the way that works is you build like a machine learning algorithm that can parse through all locations of the the entire country um, to find like a mathematical, more of a a quantitative way, I should say, more of a quantitative way of finding what a college town means. Um, So once I found that, then taking um, all the other variables and then checking their level of uh, correlation with population and then throwing that into a model that could then predict the future. That also sounds intense. Quick question for both of you. If someone were to hear this podcast and they're like, oh, like both these roles sound awesome. What would you say would be there seems to be some overlap, but what would you say would be like a main difference between the two? If someone were kind of choosing their path of um, data engineering versus data science, data uh, data scientists. Mm -hmm. So I suppose I would say um, when it comes to data engineer, you're kind of like, uh, I guess, suppose handling the data, maybe doing some restructuring and making sure that it's accessible from the other members of the team. And uh, data scientists, I'd say, is more so uh, you're looking into the data and what it actually means and then using that for whatever purposes. So the data engineer makes it readable and the data scientist analyzes it. I mean, the, those very simple terms. I apologize. I'm not trying to, to diminish your work. It seems very complicated. I'm just... <laughs> Essentially, yeah. Uh, Ahmed, do you have any uh, other yeah. takes? I would say that a data engineer has to be pretty familiar with a lot of the tools of data manipulation, whether it's kind of restructuring it, reordering it, renaming things, um, putting it in a database, so a little bit of like SQL, stuff like that. Um, whereas a data scientist has to be more comfortable with doing um, machine learning stuff, Um, using like sklearn library um, or some statistics as well to see whether how accurate what you're predicting is and what metrics you use to grade it awesome cool yeah so uh we touched upon this a a tad but could you go into detail about um sort of the the differences between working on a real life project versus some of the projects that you've worked on in school Mm -hmm. so In school, going back to what I was saying about uh, grading, um, usually in school, if they tell you to do a project, project, they usually have relatively clean data that's structured in a way such that your model could immediately take it when when Shane was talking about handing information for visualization. For our purposes, the way we wanted to visualize and the way we wanted to predict the models were very different. So that required a lot of manipulation about how things were ordered, whether things were certain columns or rows, why they were, how they were combined, stuff like that. Um, And in school, they'll say, okay, we'll give you this and we expect this as an output and this is the metric we're going to use to see whether you performed well. Um, Whereas for our application here, we kind of have to make that up ourselves and kind of put, I guess, um, provide a reason as to why we think this is the best metric to use. Um, And then trying to discover, okay, for this exact use case, I think this method might be better versus for another problem statement, it might be something else and so forth. I'd say there's two major points. Firstly, building off of uh, what Ahmed just said, uh, w- when you're handed a project in school, the professor has already worked out a solution that they expect you to follow. So, you know, if the question is like, uh, I don't know, use this data to derive this information, you know that information is stored within the data. Like there's no doubt about it because the professor, you know, assigned it to you and you're expected to get it. With 
a real world uh, application, it's like, okay, we want this. We want to answer this question about uh, the city. So you go to census and you look for uh, data related to that. And you're like, okay, I think this is a good approach. Nothing guarantees that approach will get you the information that you're actually looking for. So it's kind of just, you know, up to you to figure out what's there. We've run into situations where we were trying to answer a problem and we think we have a solution. And, you know, you find out that maybe it's impossible to answer that question because the data just isn't there. Uh, yeah. And then I guess the second point I was going to say is um, when you have a school project, you have uh, a hard deadline. Uh, you're going to be doing the project, say, usually, I don't know, maybe two weeks you have to do a project. And, you know, you do it from point A to point B and you submit it. With real world scenario, it's, you know, you have your sprint, your sprint team, you have your daily standups, uh, and you kind of figure out what you're doing along the way. Of course, you have a general idea of what you want to accomplish, but, you know, every day you're building on what you built on yesterday and, you know, you just kind of see where the project goes from there. Awesome. Yeah, it's very cool. I uh, I looked over at you when you're talking about uh, some of the agile stuff. I was like, oh, Marie, should be happy. <laughs> uh, so, can you tell people who are listening uh, and potentially people who would be interns interested, or people who would be interested in an internship at Metro Star, sort of um, what led you to Metro Star and what previous experience you had when you were applying to Metro Star and sort of that like the intern process as a whole. So for my part, what kind of pushed me to looking more into MetroStar was I was at an industry conference and there were a bunch of data scientists sitting on stage. And one of the data scientists was from MetroStar. And I was like, well, this person really knows what they're talking about. I want to know where they're working. And I kind of like wrote it in my notebook and then I applied later on. Awesome. Yeah. I think mine is uh, not as interesting. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was just kind of looking for an internship and applied to uh almost anything I could find. Though I will say, once I heard back from Metro Star, looking into the company on the website and uh, all that, I was pretty fascinated with the company. Uh, I was like, wow, I actually want to work here. This isn't like just some random application I sent out. This looks like uh, something promising. And it was. <laughs> awesome. And uh, do you have advice for those who might be applying to internships? So, uh, again, <laughs> I would just apply to anything you see. <laughs> but what, once you uh, hear back, you'll be able to figure out if this is something you really want to do or not. But, you know, it's important uh, to just apply to as many as you can because, you know, almost everyone our age is applying for internships to everywhere. You know, there's a big pool of applicants for every position and uh, you want to make sure you're part of those pools. Shane, I will say your comment is so relatable. That was exactly my same philosophy for getting my first job out of school. Like once you're graduated, I was like every day I am applying until I start hearing from people. Um, so I'm with you and would look at the companies, right? So I could like, you know, customize my cover letter. Yeah. But yeah, it is. You just got to keep going, throwing it out there. So I totally relate to your feeling of, I just applied everywhere <laughs> <laughs> and then got really lucky and was like, this is cool. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, really. I found that um, trying to do things that didn't scale worked really well. So trying to spend like a good amount of time at an individual company, even if it doesn't work out, because you can only do that for so long, trying to like research more about it. If there's somebody that's already working there, kind of reaching out to them, asking what they think about it mm -hmm. um, and doing that approach worked really well. Because I think doing that helps you kind of get your foot in the door. And then once you're there, then it's going to be about your projects and other things that you've done to actually get you the job. Um, but yeah, that's what I found worked really well for me. Nice. So did you so, reach out to that data scientist that was at the conference as well? For that well? specific one, I did not actually, oh. no. Yeah. But in other, other opportunities you've had, you have. Yeah, for previous like jobs that I've had, that's, what I, that's usually how I've gotten them. Cool. Yeah. 
We had completely opposite approaches. <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking that when you both were answering. <laughs> I mean, the other approach, I've also done that in the past. I call it like almost like the machine gun versus like the shotgun approach kind of thing. But yeah. Awesome. And then uh, what advice do you have for people who once they land their internship at Metro Star? What to do? Yeah. Like any um, advice for, yeah, sorry. That was how to make the most of it. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. That was not a complete <laughs> question. <laughs> no, you're fine. <laughs> <laughs> For me, um, whenever you're given a problem, there's usually things that you don't want to just do when you're asked to do them. It's you want to anticipate, all right, now now what? After I did this, what am I going to do next? And trying to, to have that understanding um, and maybe even meet with the manager saying, what can I do to kind of excel in this position? Like, I don't want to just know what the minimum requirements are. What is, what is looking good in, in their opinion be and trying to, to do that? Yeah. And building off of that, you know, when you're working on the project, I think it's really good and really important. Uh, I wouldn't even say just in internships, I suppose jobs in the industry as well. When you're building something, uh, just think about how this is going to scale out into the future. You know, from day one, when we were trying to figure out how to make uh, queries on Census's API, the question wasn't just, okay, how do we query for the specific information? Uh, we were like, okay, how could we structure an automated query so that we could query for whatever information we end up wanting? So you always want to account for what's going to happen next. Uh, and another thing, uh, whenever there's any sort of opportunity to try something new, go for it. You know, If they're looking for someone to work on say the EC2 server is something I worked on. It was just kind of like, okay, who wants to work on this? I said, I'll do it. <laughs> Number one, it's going to you know, make your bosses like you more because you're willing to do whatever they want you to. <laughs> and number two, you get a lot of experience. You know, you're know, you here at the internship to learn. So you want to make sure you do everything you can to learn. You know, So get out of your comfort zone and uh, pursue those things that you don't already know. No, that's great advice. I feel like we apply that even in our jobs now. Yeah. Um, like there's stuff that we volunteer for where they're like, oh, we need to do this. I'm like, I'll do it. I don't know <laughs> what I'm doing, but, you know, there's a great support system at Metro Star for you to ask those questions. You're like, hey, so I said I would do this task. I've done like some research. I like kind of know what I need to do. Can you look at what I've done <laughs> before I share this out? Like, what am I missing? Yeah, exactly. Metro Star is very good with uh, whenever we had any questions like, oh, uh, I don't really know what I'm doing with this. Is there someone you could connect me with that will uh, help me figure this out? And there's pretty much almost always someone that they could, uh, you know, link you with that uh, will help talk you through the solution. Yeah, I, I totally agree with that. I, there have been multiple times where like, I've like cold I am someone being like, hello, I know we've never met, but like, you know, can you help me? And and yeah, people are very willing and people like, I think for the most part, generally people like want to help others ex succeed and like mm -hmm. they want to be, you know, provide mentorship or provide like, you know, these are the resources that I use, like they might help you or, you know, whatever the case might be. So before we say our goodbyes and thank you for joining us, we uh, ask one fun question at the end of each of our uh, podcasts. And so uh, this question is for both of you. And it is, if you could live in one digital space for a month, which one would it be? For example, some people have said MySpace. Uh, it could be an app, an online game, a website, anything. Mm -hmm. I guess what does like live in a space mean? Like think like Wreck It Ralph. <laughs> yeah, like Wreck It Ralph. Okay. Wreck -It -Ralph. okay. Um, it would probably have to be some fantasy game. Like, <laughs> <laughs> I want an experience that I couldn't normally get. So uh, I don't know. Play some really cool game. Nice. Oh, said I was like Zelda. Like, <laughs> <laughs> like I mean, yeah, Zelda. that works. Vintage. That works. Yeah, I'm good. Damn, oh, she's dating myself this, this episode. <laughs> I was, like, I was thinking, like, the, like the Nintendo, you would have to blow on it to get the dust out and then yeah. pump it back in. That's exactly what I was thinking of. Oh my gosh, the new, sorry, really random tangent, the new Buzz Lightyear movie, they reference, like, because he has his, like, 
automated autopilot thing. He has to pull it out and blow into it and push it. Because it's going back. It's like with back with when Toy Story came out. I appreciated the nostalgia. Yeah. Yeah. I got to check that out. I will too. <laughs> um, for my part, it might be uh, Google Maps. I'm a huge fan of kind of like their UX and UI. The exact opposite approach of Shane. This is the, the most <laughs> real world you can possibly get. But something about the way they were able to put so much information, literally the entire world, on a single device that anybody from like eight to like 88 could could mm-hmm. use it and completely understand how to get exactly where they want, how they want it, um, any method of transportation. And just that amount of information in such a simplistic way is beautiful to me. Awesome. Yeah. I like the road view. Yeah. So, yeah. I, can go I think you should things. get a plane. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. So you don't want to be like Taylor Swift and get called out for all our emissions but in her defense she said other people do use her <laughs> plane <laughs> oh yeah i heard you, about this yeah, do you yeah. Know, <laughs> i don't know how appropriate this is for this episode but with the plane icon you gotta have a private jet to use google maps that way and then you Maybe get in you trouble i get that but <laughs> <laughs> you two aren't swifties <laughs> the hell and all my friends were talking about this so i met if you didn't hear um I think nope. Taylor Swift, uh, they released like a list of the celebrities with the highest uh, like carbon footprints, I mm-hmm. suppose, okay. with, with like the numbers of, you know, emissions. And they released it and Taylor Swift was at the very top with like a significant margin between her and the second place. How many people are they carrying? Are they doing it per capita, like per seat kind of thing? How many people are transporting or just her plane? Well, because... No, it was, first of all, her private plane, but uh-huh. I guess that's under her name. So it's like, you know, uh, her. And then she went out to say that she lets other people use her plane. Okay. So, you know, that's counted under her, too. Yeah. Like her like team behind her was like, oh, no, but she's so generous. And other people actually use her plane. It's not all her. And it was like, <laughs> still, that plane is still contributing. But love, love the attempt. Yeah. <laughs> So that's the random how we got from the plane icon on Google Maps <laughs> to that. After you guys asking that question so many times, where would you both want to live? In the, what digital space? The MySpace one was good. It was very nostalgia. Tom was your, your best first friend ever. Oh, yeah. He wasn't trying to steal your email addresses or steal all your data. Yeah. I, I would just... I really like Google Suite. Like, I love, like, Google Docs. I love, like, all... I mean, I guess, like, I don't, don't want to be stuck there, but is it you? Gosh, really? yeah. Like, like oh, should you be stuck in Google Slides and... But I'm thinking, like... like yeah, what do you do? I'm thinking, like, <laughs> Gmail. Like, what do you get, like... You get to, like, read, like, people's emails, but, like, not that... Like, I mean, like, I mean, like, I would do that as, like, a romance, like, but that... I'm, like, romanticizing how it would be, not just, like, on my way home. <laughs> like... <laughs> oh, that is good. Google Hangouts. Yeah. Oh, maybe, like, um... Maybe like a GoPro and like put it on my dog Ooh. and like because okay. I'd yeah, really yeah. like I love my dog and so I'd like something with my dog so I could like live like how he lives and see like how I could extend his life so he can live forever. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. okay. I know he's only three and I can't think about him getting older. <laughs> <laughs> so with these random tangents that we've gone on. <laughs> Um, any final questions? No. Awesome. Well, thank you both so much for joining us. Thanks for being part of the Metro Star internship program. Thank you for everything you contributed to the census project. And thank you for your time and mock it with us today. So yeah, thanks for having us. Yeah. yeah thanks thank, for having us. Thank you. Yeah, it was great. Hey, this is super fun. So, uh, this was mock it. Don't forget to like subscribe and share with your friends and join us next time. If you're interested in learning more about how government and tech collide, visit metrostar.com and follow us along on our socials. Marie is a former visual designer turned agile loving human centered design advocate. They have helped government organizations for almost a decade build successful digital products by aligning cross functional teams around a deep understanding of the user at the heart of their mission. Marie is passionate about advancing girls and women in technology and has curated several educational hands-on experiences for all ages. Liz is a user experience strategist turned project manager committed to human-centered driven approaches and results. 
She has worked on 20 plus higher education, government and client facing websites and software platforms, creating long lasting user focused digital solutions. Liz is devoted to equity and strives to celebrate diversity and inclusion.